I want to talk about the media that I love. I'm a college student, a film student, and I've written my fair share of essays about media at this point. But college essays are rigid and assigned, often without room for exploring personal favorites. They often require the writer to argue a very specific and pointed claim. And that's all well and good. I mean, it's invaluable to learn how to structure a text around one specific driving idea. But I found I don't often get to just talk about things that I love, and that's what I want to do. So I'll be making a short series devoted to talking at length about some of the media that I really love. Um, and I hope to be able to articulate why they're so good and why I specifically think that they're so special. So in this video, I'm going to start off light with a piece of media that I think can best be described simply as being fun. I'm talking about a criminally unknown uh, stoner comedy by director Greg Araki called Smiley Face. You might know Araki from his recent Netflix series Beef, which was really, really good. Specifically, I'd like to show in this video that Smiley Face is more than just a stoner comedy, or at least that it transcends the tropes and conventions of the genre. I think it's a film that has something a lot more substantial to say than a lot of other movies in its genre. The film, to me, is about the inability to confront one's own problems, the insecurity of being an aimless young adult, and how those two things kind of interact with one another. Smiley Face is, at face value, a stoner comedy about Jane, an aimless 20-something portrayed by Anna Faris, whose day descends into a series of unfortunate events after she eats a plate of pot cupcakes that her roommate left in the fridge. After eating the cupcakes, Jane gets in touch with her dealer with the intention of making a new batch to replace the first one. He agrees to loan her the weed, but only after threatening to steal her furniture should she fail to pay him back later that day. But Jane accidentally burns the loaned marijuana on the stove, rendering it unusable. Here begins the main conflict of the movie. Jane needs to acquire more cannabis to bake into cupcakes and get enough cash to pay back her dealer before he steals her furniture. And to do that, she must leave her apartment. This sounds pretty standard for a stoner movie, but if you were to fast forward the film by about an hour or so at this point, you'd find Jane mistakenly in possession of an original printing of the Communist Manifesto, evading the police, and attempting to unionize a meat packaging plant somewhere in between. And all of these moments are meaningful to the forwarding of the plot. The movie is funny and stressful and exhilarating all at once, while maintaining the compulsory good vibes of a proper stoner comedy. I really can't understate how well this film is edited to put the viewer in the shoes of its protagonist. It achieves this not through the use of kaleidoscopic lenses or day-glow colored animations, but through a really jumpy and off-kilter style that just feels effortless. One good example that springs to mind is a scene in which Jane is waiting to audition for a commercial. Uh, I'll put that here. Hi. Do you have any gum? I just always really love this moment. That little wah just feels so accurate to the experience of uh, being under the influence in public uh, and someone just really crashing into your field of awareness. Like, I, I feel like that wah sound is what plays in my head um, anytime someone unexpectedly talks to me in public. But I digress. By the end of the film, we find Jane standing on top of a Ferris wheel cart. Uh, she's yelling to a group gathered at the bottom of the ride that have been following her for most of the film so far. They are her friends, uh, the police, and the professor to which the copy of the Communist Manifesto rightfully belongs. This group that follows her is something that I'll come back to in a little bit, 
um, because I think it's really important to what the film is trying to do overall. But to put it simply, throughout the film, each stoned run-in that Jane has with another person results in a new bystander joining the crew of people that are slowly trailing her through the city. As she stands atop the Ferris wheel, uh, she appears to have a moment of clarity in which she decides to face all of her problems that have piled up throughout the film. She holds up the text, yells for them, and then, in a flash, the wind tears the priceless document, sweeping it into the air page by page. Finally, we see Jane sent to prison, her sentence flatly displayed on the screen. And I think in this choice of ending, we see a really unique subversive streak that the film has, uh, and it's feeling that I only get from Araki's work. I think that in Smiley Face, he's using a fairly light genre to poke at something a tad deeper, a sort of uneasy and markedly youthful anxiety. Um, I want to go a bit deeper into that, uh, but for now, suffice it to say, I think that the film, and its ending in particular, have a certain bite that isn't apparent at first glance. For a moment, let's think about a more well-known stoner comedy. Let's take something like Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, for example. In the film, the two main characters, Harold and Kumar, are sitting on their couch smoking weed when a White Castle commercial airs. Intoxicated by the allure of the White Castle slider, uh, the two go on a grand series of very slapstick, early aughts, R-rated comedy-esque adventures to get a hold of some. The two leads each have a personal conflict in the film. Uh, Harold is unable to talk to Maria, his attractive next-door neighbor, due to his social anxiety. And Kumar feels pressured uh, to become a doctor, both by his father and by a cultural stereotype surrounding Indian people becoming doctors. After their adventure concludes, Harold uses his newfound courage to approach Maria and confess his feelings to her. Likewise, Kumar, with a new sense of clarity, decides that he does in fact want to become a doctor. Uh, despite his initial reservations. Their conflicts are neatly resolved. Both characters find peace and balance in their lives in the most traditional movie way possible. Harold gets the girl, and Kumar is able to find peace enough to pursue an education that will almost certainly lead to a wealthy and comfortable life. Despite the two spending their night fighting such evils as car wrecks, racist cops, deranged raccoons, racist ex-game bros, and Neil Patrick Harris, and in achieving such feats as stealing hospital IDs with the intention of stealing medical marijuana, escaping a hillbilly foursome, performing emergency surgery on a gunshot victim, and evading Neil Patrick Harris. The two ultimately return to the state of normalcy that we met them at in the beginning of the film, uh, but now newly fit to face the challenges of their everyday lives. The film is light, and the consequences are, to put it generously, temporary. I'm not saying that's bad filmmaking or storytelling, it's just a hero's journey, and there's nothing wrong with that. Our main characters are whisked away on an adventure, prove themselves competent against seemingly insurmountable challenges, and then return back home, newly changed for the better. But Smiley Face is different. The consequences are not temporary for Jane. The mistakes she makes literally follow her throughout the film. At one point, about halfway through the film, Jane becomes excessively uncomfortable around a cop. The officer is responding to a call about a stolen wallet made by her friend Brevin. It's a wallet that Jane, importantly, didn't steal. But her anxiety gets the better of her and she takes off, only to be followed by the pair for the rest of the movie. This group of people only grows as the film goes on, becoming a small mob by the end of the film, uh, trailing Jane's confusing path of destruction and misunderstanding. They serve as a very real and tangible reminder of the pressure that is growing on Jane. It's also thematically important and important to my purpose uh, in this video to note that many of Jane's problems are created by her own avoidance of them. We as the audience repeatedly see Jane bumble her way into a misunderstanding, only to watch her turn it into a more serious problem by running away from it. 
She comes into possession of the Communist Manifesto through misunderstanding. While running from Brevin and the cop, she comes upon a house that she recognizes as belonging to a former professor of hers. She decides to go in and lie low. The man isn't home, but his mother is, and she assumes that Jane is one of her son's TAs. She gives Jane the document, and then, becoming more paranoid by the elderly woman, that Jane flees with it still in her possession. Many of her exploits are like this. Jane makes a problem bigger through the avoidance of it. Then, at the end, when Jane finds that moment of clarity that I was talking about earlier, when she realizes her best bet is to face the problems she's created so far, when she finally decides to stop avoiding her issues, she's punished for it. In the act of standing up on the ferris wheel, exposing herself to the scrutiny of the group gathered below, she destroys the document. Rather than closing her own hero's journey, returning to the starting point a changed person, Jane is arrested. And to top that all off, her furniture is stolen, and she never replaces her roommate's cupcakes. Now, I'd like to tie all of this together. Over the course of the film, we see that Jane doesn't have it all together. Early on, her boyfriend breaks up with her over the phone. Later, at an ATM, she finds out that her account is mostly empty, a fact that she seems to be surprised by. And to top it all off, she blows an important commercial audition. Jane is unambitious, kind of a burnout, avoidant of her problems. But unlike Harold and Kumar, Jane is a person whose prospects are not as promising. She doesn't have a job as an investment banker, nor does she have the potential to get into medical school. What little Jane does have, a boyfriend, an audition, is further unraveled soon after the film's start. Where Kumar is paralyzed by the thought of exiting his aimless youth, dreading the idea of committing to life as a doctor, Jane is lost in aimless youth. And the film doesn't necessarily offer a resolution to that. Jane doesn't have a simple, although admittedly daunting, path ahead of her like Kumar. Jane doesn't have a path at all. Araki refuses to give the audience the comfort of knowing that everything will be alright for Jane in the end. Instead, he tells us something much closer to the truth. Cementing yourself as a person and finding your way in the world is not simple. It's not quick and it's not easy. Insecurity and ambiguity about how things are going to turn out are both part of the process. If it's not already obvious, I love this film. Smiley Face makes me happy when I watch it. It acknowledges the absolute dysfunction of the world. It acknowledges that it is scary and threatening and inaccessible to be young and aimless in it but it's also refreshingly honest in that assessment. It doesn't avoid the implications of its story, but instead embraces them as part of the process of finding your way in the world and cementing yourself as a real person. Movie makers and storytellers more generally often feel the need to close stories neatly, to offer comfort and security in their ends to offset the ambiguity of their middles. Araki doesn't do that, at least not in this story. He shows that not having it together is part of the process of youth, being a mess can be too, and that growing from it takes time. It takes much more time than a 90 minute movie can accurately portray, and that's why I love it. <laughs>